Hello, my name is Juhan Park, a PhD candidate at IIIX Lab. The paper I'll be introducing today is 3D Gaussian Splitting for Real-Time Radiance Field Rendering, which is the foundational work of 3D Gaussian Splitting. The contents of this presentation is as follows. First, I'll give you a brief introduction on the field of novel view synthesis and its prior works. Then, we will take a look at what 3D Gaussian splitting is, how it is implemented, and the evaluations regarding its performance. Novel view synthesis refers to the generation of images from unseen viewpoints. On the image below, you can see the training dataset consisting of sparsely sampled views. Novel view synthesis aims to identify the features of the scene from these images to render an image that is not included in the dataset. The technique is being used in a wide range of areas from applications of VR and AR to architectural visualizations. One notable work of this field is the neural radiance fields, NERF for short. Radiance field is a function that returns the color and density values of an arbitrary point in 3D space. So given the viewpoint parameters indicating its position and direction, NERF shoots a ray from the position towards the direction. The position and the path of the ray are then sampled and fed into the MLP to, fed to predict the final color that is to be seen from the viewpoint. The quality of the generated scenes were pretty of high, of high quality, but the use of MLPs and the need of sampling resulted in slow training and inference speed of NERF models. Another well-known method of this field is the point-based method, which is able to efficiently synthesize the views using point clouds. But as you can see in the bottom image, the outputs suffer from holes and discontinuities. In today's paper, 3D Gaussian splatting managed to address these problems by representing the scene using 3D Gaussians, which enabled real-time synthesis of high-quality views. The, advantage, the advantages it holds over the NERF model is that it does not require ner <coughs> neural networks nor the sampling process. And the removal of these two factors allowed the model to represent uh, present the frame rates of over 100 frame FPS. And it can also better represent the scene compared to point clouds as can be confirmed in the bottom right image. You can see the 3D Gaussians forming the 3D space which is way more compact than the point clouds. The pipeline of Gaussian splitting is shown as below. <coughs> The pipeline is split, split into two stages, the initialization of 3D Gaussians and the optimi optimization process that optimizes their attributes. This is the algorithm of Gaussian splitting written in pseudocode provided by the authors. First, we apply structure from motion onto the multi-view images to generate the sparse point clouds that approximates the scene shown in the images. The point clouds are returned as the XYZ coordinates and these values will be set as the means of the 3D Gaussians as the image shown below. And as we all know, we also need variances to represent the Gaussian distribution, so we also need to initialize the covariance for the 3D Gaussians. The authors define the Gaussians as anisotropic because it can better represent the scene as in the bottom image. The difference between an isotropic Gaussian and an anisotropic Gaussian is that the variance is not necessarily aligned to the axis for the latter. The matrix on the top is the covariance matrix for a 3D Gaussian, but there is one problem with this approach. The covariance matrix is only valid if it is put <coughs> positive semi-definite which means that it is symmetric and for an arbitrary real vector V, V transposed multiplied by the matrix multiplied by V should always be non-negative. 
but directly applying the optimization process will likely violate such constraints, so we need a workaround, workaround to, this, to this problem. The intuition of the authors is that the covariance matrix sigma is in a sense similar to the formula that generates an ellipsoid. An ellipsoid is like a stretched and rotated version of a normal Gaussian distribution, so they decided to formulate the covariance using the rotation matrix and the scaling matrix as in this formula. And in case you want to comprehend the theoretical backgrounds of this formula, you can refer to the eigen decomposition of covariance matrices. And so in conclusion, the covariance of 3D Gaussians are represented using a rotation matrix and a scaling matrix. Now we need to define the colors of the Gaussians. <coughs> but one thing to notice that the color attributes should be dependent on the viewing angle, as many real-world objects exhibit different colors from the front, side, and rear views. To implement this, we, the authors decided to adopt spherical harmonics, which is a function that returns the color of the point on the surface of a sphere based on the given polar angle theta and the azimuthal angle psi. The function is very complex, so we will only take a high-level overview. The color of the given point is the weighted sum <coughs> of the spherical harmonic functions multiplied by the corresponding spherical harmonic coefficient k. These k's are the targets of optimization, and the user can select the degree of harmonic by modifying the value of l. The bottom image show, shows how the color map of the spherical sphere changes by the value of L, L and M, with higher L values resulting in more complex color maps. The authors of 3DGS selected the L value of 2, which is the same value that the previous works util utilized in spherical harmonics have chosen. The final value A stands for the opacity of the Gaussians, which ranges from 0 to 1. The opacity value of 1 indicates that you won't be able to see anything through it. And now that we have all the attributes initialized, we can start the optimization process. The optimization process is divided into two main parts. The first part shows shown here, optimizes the parameters of the 3D Gaussians based on the rendered scenes. The data set consists of pairs of images and corresponding camera, pa camera parameters. The camera parameter, along with the attributes of the 3D Gaussians, are passed into the rasterizer, which the authors call the tile-based rasterizers. The rasterizer outputs the synthesized view of the corresponding camera parameter, which is then compared with the ground truth image of that view. The losses computed between the two and the gradients computed optimizes the attributes of the 3D Gaussians. Okay, so now let's take a look at what happens inside the tile-based rasterizer. So the, the first step is call Gaussian, which excludes the Gaussians that are not included in the views frustum to increase computational efficiency as well as prevent artifacts generated by Gaussians stuck in the borders. This is similar to the frustum calling used in computer graphics. The next step involves projecting the 3D Gaussians with the viewing frustum to image space, a process also referred to as splatting. The formula for projection is similar to the representation of covariance using the rotation matrix and the scaling matrix, except that the transformation matrices are used to project the Gaussians to different spaces. The viewing transform W projects the 3D Gaussians onto the camera space, and the Jacobian matrix serves as the approximation of the project projective transform to project the 3D Gaussians onto the image space. After the Gaussians are splatted onto the images, the image is subdivided into multiple tiles, giving the rasterizer its name, tile-based rasterizer. The image is based divided into 16 times 16 tiles, 
which utilize parallel processing of GPUs. And in this section, the Gaussians are assigned keys that indicate its view space depth for all tiles that it covers. For, ex for example, if the Gaussian number 7 is located on the tiles of IDs 0 and 1, and the Gaussian number of 13 is located on the tiles of IDs 16 and 32, the keys would be generated, a generated as below. Uh, the Gaussians are then sorted by the depth values in the ascending order. The, so those with low depth values will be placed in front and those with high values will be placed in the back. The tiles are then provided a list of sorted Gaussians that are located within them. Now we compute the color for each pixel. The pixels receive the list of Gaussians of the tile they belong to. Then, beginning from the front of the list, the Gaussians are applied alpha blending to compute the color for each pixel. The alpha blending continues through the list, until, through the list of Gaussians until the accumulated saturation of the Gaussians reaches the target value, which is in most cases 1. And after the colors of the pixels are determined, the final image is returned from the rasterizer. The image from the rasterizer is now compared with the ground truth image using the objective function. The objective function is a weighted sum of an L1 loss with a DSSIM loss, which is a SSIM loss designed for floating data points, floating point data. The loss is then propagated to provide gradients for the attributes of the 3D Gaussians. The second optimization stage is done by adaptively controlling the Gaussians, which is done in every 100 steps. This step refines the sparse set of Gaussians into a denser set that better represents the scene. The first method is the removal of unnecessary Gaussians. Gaussians that are too transparent with alpha values below the threshold are removed, and also the Gaussians that are morbidly large are also removed to facilitate the compact scene representation. The second method is called Gaussian densification. It focuses on regions with missing geometric features, also referred to as under-reconstructed, and but also in regions where Gaussian covers large areas in the scene, which is also referred to as over-reconstructed areas. And during the experiments, the authors observed that the Gaussians located in both areas have large view space positional gradients, <coughs> and they decided to select the Gaussians whose view space positional gradient is lar larger than the threshold for densification. So they set a threshold for the covariance of the Gaussian, and if the covariance of the Gaussian is larger than the threshold, the area is declared over-reconstructed, and the Gaussian is, split, Gaussian is split into two new ones, with their size scaled by a factor of 1.6. And on the other hand, if the covariance of the Gaussian is smaller than the threshold, the area is declared under-reconstructed, and the Gaussian is cloned <coughs> to fill in the space. Uh, the optimization process is terminated when the 3D Gaussians converge to a local minima. And the following sections provide the evaluations on the performance of 3D Gaussians, Gaussian, spla Gaussian splattings. Uh, for real-world scenes, for real-world scenes, the 3D Gaussian splatting outperforms all the comparison targets, even with the 3D Gaussian splatting version optimized for 7,000 iterations instead of full 30,000. This comparison is done for the synthetic scenes rendered using Blender. The synthetic scenes provide much accurate ca camera positions cam compared to real-world scenes, so they greatly improve the performance scores. 
This section presents the ablation tests for various components. Initialization of point clouds based on SFMs seem to have significant effect. So when the point clouds are initialized randomly instead of using SFMs, the quality of the synthesized scenes greatly decreases. And the authors also experimented whether restricting gradient flow to a certain number of Gaussians would preserve the quality of the synthesized scenes while reducing computational loads. But the results, however, show that the quality drops hard when the <coughs> gradients are restricted. This experiment shows how the densification process affects the synthesized scene. Removing the split of Gaussians result in blurred scenes, whereas removing the clone of Gaussians result in missing features, such as the wires of the tire. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments. Thank you.